Okay, so today um, we want to look at a couple of things. Um, firstly, the objective of today's lesson um, is to answer some questions on alcohols, do a summary of alcohols because that was the last thing we did, um, and then start talking about carboxylic acids. Right, um, that's the intention of today's lesson. Right, um, it is geared to helping reinforce firstly the concept on alcohols and then introducing you to carboxylic acids. Right, um, organic chemistry can be very simple once you begin to understand the principles behind it, but it can be very complicated if we don't take the time to try and understand what is happening. Okay, so let's get right into it. I'm going to start off with a couple of questions. Uh, the first question, uh, what is used in the production of ethanol from ethene? So if I have an alkene and I want to produce an alcohol, they're asking you, what do I need to produce that? And based on our conversation last time, I supposed to have water present to convert an alkene to alcohol. I need to have water present. So hydrogen and oxygen, that's not the answer, right? Because I need two hydrogens and oxygen, not just one hydrogen. Oxygen only, that's not the answer. Uh, yeast, that's not the answer because yeast is an enzyme, but steam is water vapor. So hence the answer is C as in cat. All right, next question. Which term describes the formation of ethanol from glucose? Which term describes the formation of ethanol from glucose? Now, if we have glucose, just think about your fruits, right? You know when granny used to make um, the what, um, grape wine, and cherry wine and um, popo wine and all these things. When they stop and they take these fruits and they make wine out of it, they would have utilized a process known as fermentation. Fermentation in the presence of an enzyme will convert the glucose into alcohol. In this case, it would be ethanol. So answer to our question, which term describes it? It would be fermentation. It cannot be cracking because cracking involves the presence of heat energy, right? Distillation, well, we could distill it to extract the ethanol, but the main process that is involved is fermentation, right? The main process involved is fermentation. So the answer is C as in cat. Next question. Which statement about ethanol is correct? Ethanol, the first one they say, it burns in air to form ethene and water. That is wrong. When a, a hydrocarbon burns, it produces carbon dioxide and water, not ethene and water. It is prepared from ethene by fermentation. No, not just by fermentation, but you need a uh, you need yeast, the enzyme, in order to do this preparation. Uh, it is prepared from glucose in an addition reaction. That is not true. When you're using glucose, you need this fermentation process. So it's not supposed to, ethene not supposed to be there. Glucose should have been there with the presence of an enzyme, and then that would have been correct. So A is wrong, B is wrong, C is wrong. It is the only product when ethene reacts with steam. That is correct. When ethene reacts with steam, all that we get from it is ethanol. So the answer, I believe, is D. Let's see what they say. Yes, the answer is D as in dog. Question four. Ethanol can be formed by fermentation, one, or two, reaction between steam and ethene. They say, which of these processes uses a catalyst? Fermentation requires yeast. Uh, 
right? And the reaction between steam and ethene that also requires a catalyst, right? So the answer in for this, in my opinion, is A as an apple. They both require a catalyst for this process to take place, right? Because the one with steam must also happen at high temperatures. Yes, the answer is A as an apple. Question five. The flow chart shows the preparation of ethanol and some important chemistry of ethanol. Substance X undergoes fermentation. It produces ethanol. It undergoes a process Y. Carbon dioxide plus another substance is produced. What are X, Y, and Z? Now, if something undergoes fermentation, you're looking at some form of sugar will undergo fermentation, right? The sugar that we will be looking at is glucose, right? Glucose is that sugar that we are looking at. So we're looking for the one that has glucose in it. X is glucose. So X is glucose. X undergoes fermentation to give me ethanol. The process that will give me carbon dioxide and something, it's supposed to be carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide and water is produced. So that process Y is combustion, right? So the answer to this question is B as in boy, right? Substance X is glucose. The process Y is combustion and it produces carbon dioxide and the substance Z is water or water vapor which is D. So hence the answer is B as in boy. Question six. By which of the following methods is ethanol formed? First, you have fractional distillation of petroleum, you have fermentation too, and you have uh, catalytic addition of steam to ethene. Right? So which of these processes is ethanol formed? Ethanol is not formed from fractional distillation of petroleum, right? This can give you alkenes or alkenes, but it is formed from fermentation and it is also formed from catalytic addition of steam to enzyme, to ethene, sorry. So the answer is two and three only. So the answer is C as in cat. Next one, an organic compound has the molecular structure C4H8, and one is H9OH. So the molecular formula is C4H9OH. Which type of organic compound is this? The first thing you look for is the functional group. And the functional group in this case is a OH group. The OH group indicates to us that a alcohol is present. The OH group indicates that an alcohol is present. So therefore, the answer to this question is A as in apple. Next question. Question eight. Which rule co correctly describes the production of ethanol and its properties? Which rule? correctly describes the production of ethanol and its properties. Now, when we're going to produce ethanol, ethanol can be made from glucose. That is correct. So it's either A or B is our answer. This is correct. It can be made from ethene. Yes, that is correct. It could be made from ethene. So this is correct. It is used as a fuel. Yes, it is used as a fuel. So that is correct. And it is used as a solvent. Yes, it is used as a solvent. So that is correct. So the answer that I have all of these is A as in apple. So our answer is A. Let's see what they tell us. They tell us the answer is A as well. All right, question nine. Which statement about the names of organic compounds is correct? Which statement about the names of organic compounds is correct? Now, Compounds containing carbon, carbon double bonds are alkenes. That is wrong. This should be alkenes, not alkenes. So that makes A wrong. 
the compound of formula CH3CO2H is methanoic acid. Met is one, but we have two carbons present, so this cannot be methanoic acid, so this is wrong. The compound of the formula C2H4 is ethane. No, this has the formula CnH2n. So that is telling us that we have an alkene, not an alkene. So this should be an E, not an A. So this again is wrong. That leaves us with this one. The compound of formula C2H5OH, this here is the conditional formula for an alcohol. That is correct. So the answer is D as in dog. All right, next question. Question 10. Ethanol is manufactured from petroleum by reacting ethene with steam. Which statement about this process is correct? Ethanol is manufactured from petroleum by reacting ethene with steam. Which statements about this process are correct? So ethene is obtained from cracking of alkene. That is correct. We take an alkene, on the, allow it to undergo cracking and it will help us to produce an alkene. That is correct. Uh, the process is carried out uh, in the presence of yeast. No, that is not correct. Process is not carried out in the presence of yeast. Ethanol is manufactured from petroleum by reacting ethene with steam. If we wanted to use yeast, then we needed glucose not ethene. Glucose is what we would have needed. The reaction is an addition reaction. Uh, yes, it is an addition reaction because it's an alkene and we are adding water across the double bond in the form of steam. So yes, it's an addition reaction. And the rate of reaction is increased by a catalyst. Yes, a catalyst speeds up the rate of a reaction. So our answer is 1, 3, and 4, D as in dog. 10 years and dog, all right? Number 11, ethene reacts with Y to produce ethanol. Ethene reacts with Y to produce ethanol and they have the formula, they show you ethene reacting with Y and it's giving you ethanol and they ask you what is Y. So ethene reacts with Y, Y has to be steam or water vapor H2O. This breaks apart into H plus ions and OH minus ions, all right? H plus ions and OH minus, and that is added across the double bond. The double bond breaks, H is added onto one side and OH is added onto the next side. So steam is our answer. The answer is C as in cat. Next question, ethanol is made by fermentation. Question, how is ethanol obtained from the fermentation mixture? How is ethanol obtained from the fermentation mixture? So the first option they give us is chromatography. Now it can't be chromatography because chromatography involves taking a chromatogram, which is a strip of filter paper, placing a sample on it and allowing the sample to move up the paper. That have nothing to do with what we're talking about. Crystallization is the formation of crystals. We're not trying to make crystals. We're trying to get ethanol. So this is not the answer. Electrolysis is the splitting of a compound by uh, electricity, right, to obtain the relative ions. We are not splitting anything. In fact, we are trying to form or make ethanol. So the only thing we are left with is fractional distillation. Right, so ethanol is made by fermentation. Um, what are we fermenting? We are fermenting glucose. Right, and when glucose is fermented, we use yeast, right, which is an enzyme, as the active ingredient to help break down the glucose. And then from that, the ethanol can be extracted by fractional distillation. So the answer to this one is D as in dog.
All right. Next question. Ethanol can be manufactured from substance X. Substance X plus steam um, in the presence of a catalyst gives us ethanol. And they ask us, what is substance X? So let me see. Let me give you 30 seconds to try this one now. I've tried the first 12. Let me see um, what you think the answer for this one is. All right, so let's look at our options. All right, uh, we have carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide plus steam, uh, that's A is out. Okay, right, so yes, the answer is B as in boy, ethene. Ethene plus steam would give us ethanol. So B is correct. All right, B is correct. It cannot be hydrogen. Hydrogen plus steam will not give us ethanol. So it sees out and it cannot be oxygen. Oxygen plus steam will not give us ethanol. So our only answer here is B as in boy. That is correct. Good job. Question 40. The equation shows an industrial process. You have water, H2O, plus C2H4, which is ethene in the presence of a catalyst, gives you compound X. And the question they ask, what is the name of compound X? So what is compound X? I'll give you 30 seconds to try it. All right, let's look at our options now. So you have option A, ethene. This is an alkene. And we have water or water vapor being added to it. So this is the same question as the one before, except they just change the way in which they represent it. And instead of putting steam, they put water. C C2H4 is an alkene. So the compound that is produced is an alcohol. So we are looking for an alcohol. So if this is ethene, E-T-H-E-N-E, -E, this is an alkene, therefore the compound that produced would be the corresponding alcohol, which should be ethanol. So the answer is C as in cat, ethanol. Next question, question 15. Which type of compound is shown below? All right. So I give you 30 seconds to try. Yes, that is the answer. The answer is A as in apple. Right, it's an alcohol. And how we know it's an alcohol? It is because of the presence of the OH group. That tells us that an alcohol is present. So our answer is E as in apple. All right. Next question. Which statement about ethanol are correct? Which statements about ethanol are correct? It can be made by fermentation. Yes, it can be made by fermentation. What we ferment, we would ferment glucose. Glucose is fermented. And when it is fermented, we can from that extract by fractional distillation ethanol. It is an unsaturated compound. Unsaturated compounds have double bonds present, right? We are dealing with ethanol. Ethanol has only single bonds, so it cannot be considered an unsaturated compound. In fact, ethanol is saturated, not unsaturated. Next, it burns in air and can be used as a fuel. Yes, ethanol will burn in air to give you carbon dioxide and water, 
And yes, it can be used as a fuel, right? As a source of fuel. So answer options one and C is correct. So we look A is out. B, B is not the answer. So C, one and three only, that is our answer. Right, so the answer to this question is C is in fact one and three alone. Next question. Question 70. Ethanol is produced from either ethene or sugar. Which type of chemical reaction is used in each case? Ethanol is produced from either ethene or sugar. Question is asking us which type of chemical reaction is used in each case. So ethene to ethanol, that process, that's an addition process. So it's either A or B, right? Because water is being added across the double bond on ethene to give us the ethanol. And from sugar to ethanol, it means the sugar, which is glucose, needs to undergo fermentation. After it undergoes fermentation, then ethanol can be obtained by fractional distillation. So it must first undergo fermentation. So addition for the first one, fermentation for the second one. The answer is A, as in apple. All right, so if you came up with A, A is the correct answer. Next question. The table shows the boiling point of four members of the homologous series of alcohols. So they have the table there. The question, what is the value of X? Now, just think logically, watch the numbers. You don't have to be smart or, or, or super bright to figure this one out. Just look at the numbers. It goes from 65 to 78, then 117. So the answer that we have to get has to be an answer that is somewhere between 78 and 117. The actual answer is C as in cat, which is 98 degrees Celsius. All right, it's 98 degrees Celsius. So the first one goes from 65 to 78. That's a change of about 13. All right, 78 to 98 is a change of about 20, right? So which is not exactly the same, but within that um, large range. And then from 98 to 117, it shows a proportional change, right? So 98 to 108, that is 10, 108 to 117 is nine. So that's a change of 19. So if we were to use this, it would mean to say that this changed by about 13, then it would have changed here when it reached the 98 by about 20, and then it changed here by about 19, which makes this the most possible or most likely answer. 98, the answer, 98 degrees Celsius. C as in cut for question 18. Question 19. Which of the statements about ethanol are correct? You have one ethanol can be formed by an addition reaction. Yes, that is correct. What would we be adding? Um, you could add steam across ethene, and that will give you ethanol. Right? Uh, ethanol can be formed by fermentation. Yes, ethanol could be formed by fermentation. Um, glucose, glucose can be can undergo fermentation uh, by putting it in the presence of an enzyme yeast. And that would help us to produce ethanol. The ethanol could then be extracted by fractional distillation. Then when ethanol burns in air, uh, it forms carbon dioxide and water. Yes, that is correct. So one is correct, two is correct, three is correct. The answer is A as in apple. Yes, the answer is A as in apple. Moving right along. Which process is not used during the production of ethanol? Which process is not used during the production of ethanol? I do apologize for the letters not coming out here. That's supposed to be fermentation. All right. So addition of steam to ethene. Yes, this is involved in the production of ethanol. Fermentation. Yes, that is involved in the um, 
process of uh, the production of ethanol. Fractional distillation, yes, that is involved in the process of the production of ethanol. Uh, reacting ethy ethene with oxygen, no. Nowhere does reacting ethene with oxygen help give ethanol. So the answer, the one that is not D as in dog, this one here is your answer. D as in dog, that's the only one that is not used during the production of ethanol. So the answer is D as in dog. 21, which row is correct for ethanol? You have the first one, A, it burns. Yes, it burns, ethanol burns. You can burn ethanol. It's made by fermentation. Yes, it's made by fermentation. So both of them are correct. Yes, yeah, so the answer is A as an apple. It can burn and it can be made by fermentation. That is correct. So the answer is for 21 is A as an apple. 22. Which statement about ethanol is not correct? Which statement about ethanol is not correct? Say it can be used as a fuel. Yes, ethanol can be used as a fuel. It can be used as a solvent. Yes, if something cannot dissolve in water, you could use ethanol, which is an organic solvent, and you could dissolve things in it. Uh, it is formed by a reaction between steam and ethane. No, it's not between steam and ethane. Is between steam and ethene. Its functional group is OH. That is correct. Its functional group is indeed OH. So the answer um, is C as in cat. That is the one that is not correct. 23. Ethanol is an important chemical produced by the something of something. Which words correctly complete gaps one and two? So ethanol is produced by the combustion of ethane. No, it's not the combustion of ethane. By the combustion of glucose? No, it's not produced by the combustion of glucose. By the fermentation, so it's the fermentation of something. But if fermentation is happening, it will not be with the alkane. It will be fermentation with glucose. So the answer is D as in dog. Fermentation of glucose. D as in dog is our answer. 24. Next question. All right, so I'll leave this one for you to attempt. Let's see. The diagram represents the molecule of an organic compound. And the question asks, what is the name of the compound? I'll give you 30 seconds to try. All right, so yes, the answer is a C as in cat ethanol. The answer is C as in cat ethanol, that is correct. So this here represents a carbon, this represents a carbon. This tells us that we have hydrogens here. This is an oxygen and a hydrogen. So most likely we are dealing with a alcohol. So this is probably ethanol. The answer is C as in cat, that's correct. Good guys. Next question, 25. When glucose is fermented, ethanol is formed together with something. When glucose is fermented, ethanol is formed together with, the answer for this is carbon dioxide. Right? This is an anaerobic process, so which means to say oxygen is not present. Carbon dioxide is present. So when glucose undergoes fermentation, ethanol is formed along with carbon dioxide. The answer for this is E as in apple. All right, question 26. All right, I give you 30 seconds to try this one. Compounds containing five carbon atoms in a molecule may have names beginning with pent. 
what is the name of the compound shown below? Yes, the answer is C as in cat, pentanol. That is correct. You will have five carbons inside of here. One, two, three, four, five. This represents hydrogen. This represents an oxygen and a hydrogen. So pent, and you have OH. So it's pentanol. So the answer is C, pentanol. All right, so just two more questions I have for you, and then that's the end of the, the question session that I'm going to do. This was just to um, provide some background and support for what we did last class, 27. What is not essential for the formation of ethanol by fermentation? The question is, what is not essential for the formation of ethanol by fermentation? So I give you 30 seconds to try. Let's see what you come up with. A as in apple, yes, that is correct. A as in apple. Light is not necessary. Light is not essential for the formation of ethanol by fermentation, right? If light was necessary, the, the process that requires light is something like photosynthesis. That would require light. Um, if we would, were dealing with alkanes, then yes, that would require light or UV light in order for a reaction to take place but this is not a photochemical reaction, so light is not necessary. So the answer is A as in apple. All right, so on to our final question. Uh, ethene reacts with Y to produce ethanol. Ethene reacts with Y to produce ethanol. Ethene plus Y gives us ethanol. The question is, what is Y? What do you think is Y? 30 seconds, guys. C as in cat. Y is steam. That is correct. Ethene plus water vapor gives us ethanol. Yes, that is correct. C is our answer. Ethene reacts with steam to produce ethanol. All right. So yes, our answer is C as in cat. All right. So what we just did there, we went through uh, some questions to apply some of the things that we were talking about in the previous session as it relates to alcohols. So now what we are going to do is a little summary of what alcohols is all about. In the video, you will learn some of the chemical properties of alcohols, how to classify alcohols, and some uses of the alcohols. Alcohols are organic molecules with the hydroxyl functional group, which is an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen, OH. Here is methane. Replace a hydrogen with the alcohol functional group to form methanol. Here is ethane. And here is ethanol. Propane and propanol. Pause the video and name this molecule. This was butanol. Did you get it right? The general formula of the alcohols is CnH2n plus 1 OH. The OH group generally makes alcohols polar molecules. The hydroxyl group also gives rise to hydrogen bonding. In our video on fractional distillation, we discussed how increasing chain length increased the boiling point due to increased intermolecular forces. The alcohols follow this same trend, but their boiling point is even higher than their comparable alkanes, and this is due to the hydrogen bonding. Alcohols are placed in one of three categories, 
primary, secondary or tertiary based on the position of the OH on the chain. Alcohols will react differently depending on the category they are in. In a primary alcohol, the carbon atom on which the OH group is bonded is itself attached to only one carbon chain or one alkyl group. Here is propan-1-ol. The OH is attached to the end carbon and this carbon is attached to just one single chain of carbons. In secondary alcohols, the carbon atom on which the OH group is bonded is attached to two carbon chains or two alkyl groups. Here is propan 2 -ol. Here is the carbon atom on which the OH is attached and here you can see the two alkyl groups or two chains of carbons attached to this carbon. In tertiary alcohols, there are three carbon chains attached to the carbon on which the OH group is attached. As you can see, the carbon attached to the OH group is attached to three alkyl groups, making it a tertiary alcohol. It is important to categorise an alcohol as they have slightly different chemical properties. A good example of this that you could look into as further reading would be the oxidation of alcohols, with different reactions occurring for primary, secondary and tertiary alcohols. Different alcohols have different uses at home and in industry. Ethanol is of course a common alcohol used in beverages, but it is also an important antiseptic. Ethanol can be made by two main methods, by fermentation and by the hydration of ethene. We have made a video on these molecules to learn about these methods in more detail. Other uses of alcohols are as fuels, preservatives and solvents. Now, at the end of this tutorial, you should be able to identify the alcohol functional group, name alcohols, understand their uses and be able to categorise them as primary, secondary or tertiary. This is the second video that I have inserted. There's a great demand for alcohols in industry. We use them to make antifreeze for our engines and for antiseptics to disinfect the skin. If you've ever used a hand sanitizer that works without water, that will have contained an alcohol. We also used a two carbon alcohol, ethanol, as an ingredient in alcoholic drinks. The alcoholic drinks industry is huge and making beer or wine requires science. The process for making alcoholic drinks is called fermentation. The reactant in fermentation is sugar. It comes from natural plant extracts, barley in beer making and grapes in wine making. These sugars have the general molecular formula C6H12O6. Fermentation converts them into ethanol and carbon dioxide. You might notice this equation isn't balanced yet, so have a go as a mini challenge. Pause and continue when ready. Here's the answer. The problem is, this reaction happens far too slowly to be of use to industry, but it can be catalyzed by the enzymes of a naturally occurring fungus called yeast. Let's move on to our second route. This one also makes ethanol, this time from a hydrocarbon called ethene. You might have come across it in our videos on hydrocarbon cracking. Here's the ethene molecule and its molecular formula. Here's the ethanol molecule from before. Now look at the numbers of each atom on both sides. Can you think of a very common molecule we can add to ethene to produce ethanol? Again, pause and think, then resume. Well, the answer is the good old water molecule. It's reacted with the ethene in steam form and the ethene double bond breaks open, allowing addition of H2O. Phosphoric acid is used as a catalyst. Note that ethanol is the only product in this reaction. 
The ethene route is faster and more efficient as there is no waste product formed, only the useful one. Fermentation also yields carbon dioxide, which isn't useful to us. But ethene is cracked from crude oil, which is a non-renewable resource, so we won't be able to carry on acquiring it this way forever. Plant sugars, on the other hand, are a renewable resource. The ethene route also requires much more energy. The initial crude oil must be heated to a high temperature, and so too does the water to create steam. The fermentation route requires heating only to 37 degrees. In today's video, we're going to look at what alcohols are. And we'll also cover their properties and their uses. Just like the alkanes and alkenes that we've seen in previous videos, alcohols are another homologous series of organic compounds. They look almost the same as alkanes, but importantly, they have an OH functional group in the place of one of the hydrogens. Their names are also very similar, except we replace the final E with an ol. So instead of ethane, this molecule would be ethanol. When it comes to your exams, you need to make sure that you know the first four alcohols in the homologous series. So methanol, ethanol, propanol, and butanol. And you also need to know that the general formula for alcohols is CnH2n plus 1 OH. And when you write the formula, you should always put the OH at the end like we have here. Next up, we have the properties of alcohols. Like with all homologous series, the properties of alcohols change as we go along the series because the molecules get bigger. But for these first four, they all have pretty similar properties. In particular, they're flammable, soluble, and they can be oxidized to form carboxylic acids. Let's start with their flammability. All this really means is that they can undergo complete combustion in air, which is where they react with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. If you need to write one of these equations yourself, just write your alcohol, like ethanol, plus O2 goes to form carbon dioxide plus H2O. And then once you've got all of this down, you can just balance it like you would with any other equation. The fact that they're soluble doesn't really need much explaining. It just means that they can dissolve in water to form a solution. And because alcohols aren't acidic or alkaline, their solutions will have a neutral pH. Now, we cover carboxylic acids and how they're formed in their own video. But basically, if we take an alcohol, like ethanol, and oxidize it by adding an oxygen, then we can form a carboxylic acid, which has this functional group here of COOH. One last quick thing we need to cover are the uses of alcohols. We've already seen that alcohols are flammable and undergo combustion. This means that we can use alcohols as fuels, which releases loads of energy. For example, if you've ever used one of these spirit burners at school, then that's exactly what you're doing. You're burning an alcohol, like ethanol, to release energy. The other use of alcohols is as solvents in industry. Alcohols are often used instead of water because alcohols can dissolve things that water can't dissolve, particularly things like hydrocarbons and lipid compounds, like fats and oils. All right, so that brings us to the end of carboxylic acids, sorry, alcohols, and we are now going to carboxylic acids. 
right? Uh, when we talk about carboxylic acids, they have the general formula CnH2n plus 1 COOH. They have the general formula CnH2n plus 1 COOH. All right, uh, they have the functional group COOH. So when we look to try and identify a carboxylic acid, we are more often than not looking for that COOH. We are looking for that. We are looking for C double bonded O to OH. We are looking for that group, right? We are always looking for that group. So we have uh, methanoic acid met because we only have one carbon present, and noic because they have that C double bond O OH group. Yes, uh, when we deal with methanoic acid, met has one carbon and has a C double bond O OH group. With ethanoic acid, you have uh, two carbons present, so therefore et is correct. You have C2, and then of course there's that COOH group. Propanoic acid, we have three carbons present, so met et prop three carbons, and there's that there's that C double bond O OH group. Then you have butanoic acid. You have four carbons present, but again, there is that C double bond O, OH group, right? In all of them, you're seeing C double bond O, OH. There is that functional group for acids. So now we're looking at the properties of ethanoic acid. Weak acids with high pH and a low dissociation are formed by the oxidation of ethanol and with it's happened with acidified potassium manganate seven or at acidified potassium to manganate right carboxylic acids they react with alcohols to give an ester now an ester is characterized by the functional group C double bond O O. An ester has the functional group C double bond O O, while the acid has C double bond O O H. Carboxylic acids react with alcohols to give the ester. In a condensation reaction, so for example, now the word condense means water is given off most times. So ethanoic acid plus ethanol gives ethyl ethanoate. Now remember, we take the prefix of the alcohol and we add YL to it, so it gives us ethyl. And then we take the prefix of the ethanoic acid, we remove OIC and we add OATE. So we end up with ethanoate. So we end up with ethyl ethanoate, which is the ester plus water. So again, just to show you how it would look, what's the name of it and the state that it would be in, the general formula, the molecular formula, when n is equal to 1, when n is equal to 4. And of course, you should be able to do this with the first 10 carbons. Of course, only the first 4 is given here. But you should begin to see the pattern that is developing from it. Uh, when we have 1, carbon it's in its liquid state two carbons in its liquid state all of the carboxylic acids when we have them the state that they're in at room temperature and pressure is in the liquid state if you notice the prefix present methanoic ethanoic propanoic butanoic met et prop but all right so the reactions of carboxylic acids that process that we spoke about a while ago, where we, where we formed the ethyl ethanoate, that process is called the esterification, which is the making of 
of an ester, right? So the esterification of ethanol gives us ethanoic acid. So we take an acid plus an alcohol and it gives us an ester. An acid plus an alcohol gives us an ester. Apart from the normal reactions of acids, such as reactions with metals and bases, ethanoic acid, along with all the carboxylic acids, would react with ethanol or other alcohols to give ethyl ethanoate or an ester in the process. So all they're telling you here is that an acid plus an alcohol will give you an ester plus water. An acid plus an alcohol gives you an ester plus water. That's what they're telling us. All right, so let's take a look at this diagram. If we were to set up a boiling tube in a beaker of cold water, right, as in this diagram that we have in front of us, and we add a few centimeters of ethanol to it, uh, followed by ethanoic acid, right? Um, basically, what we will have a forming inside of here would be the formation of a ester. That's what we are saying. So set up a boiling tube in a beaker of cold water, as in the diagram that was given above, and add a few centimeters depth of ethanol followed by another few centimeters of ethanoic acid from a bottle. Then carefully add a few drops of concentrated sulfuric acid. Now the reason why they're adding the concentrated sulfuric acid, uh, it's the alcohol and the acid. This, must, this reaction must take place under acidic conditions. Right, that's the reason for adding concentrated sulfuric acid so that the reaction takes place under acidic conditions. Right now, this must be done very carefully because concentrated sulfuric acid is dangerous and it can burn you. So, when it is being handled, it must be handled with care. It must be added to the boiling tube. Add an anti bumping granule or two and heat up the water bath until the reaction mixture in the boiling tube starts to boil gently. Keep the reaction boiling gently for about 15 minutes. Then raise the boiling tube out of the water bath and leave it to cool. cool. Carefully add some sodium or calcium carbonate to the boiling tube until no more fizzing is produced. And then filter the solution and carefully smell the clear liquid that is remaining. Right, so when they tell you to carefully smell, they don't mean for you to take your nose and push it down inside of the boiling tube. It means for you to waft the scent to your nose using your hands. Right, waft the scent to your nose using your hands is what they're asking you to do. Right, in essence, what we expect to happen carboxylic acid, in all that we just said, will react with an alcohol to produce organic compounds that we call esters. A acid plus an alcohol under acidic conditions will produce an ester, right? An acid plus an alcohol under acidic conditions will produce an ester. So ethanoic acid plus ethanol will produce ethyl ethanoate, which is our ester. Some concentrated sulfuric acid is added to act as a catalyst for the reaction Right, it removes the water produced in the reaction, thus helping the reaction to produce more products. Right, concentrated sulfuric acid must be present for this reaction to take place. Why? Because it removes water. You have an OH group here, and you have an OH group here. You have C double bond OOH, and you have OH. Right? And they're telling you that water is being removed from these products. Water is being removed. So by removing water, we will end up with the formation of C double bond O. O. 
right? OH and H is being removed. OH and H is being removed. So therefore, you have water. So then O comes and bonds. From here, O comes and bonds with the, um, the O, with the carbon that is here, because the OH has been removed and hydrogen has been removed. So what we are left with is C double bond bonded to O, and that helps us to form the ester. All right, that helps us to form the ester. All right, so preparation of ethanoic acid. Now, by the oxidation of ethanol, now, if you remember the word oxidation, oxidation is the loss in electrons for the gain in oxygen. All right, oxidation is the loss in electrons for the gain in oxygen. So by oxidation of ethanol, in fermented solution with atmospheric oxygen, in the presence of certain bacteria, we can pre or prepare ethanoic acid. This is why wine smells like vinegar when it is exposed to air. The ethanol is being oxidized into ethanoic acid, right? Wine smells like vinegar because the ethanol or the alcohol is being converted to the acid when it is exposed to air or oxygen, right? It undergoes oxidation by gaining oxygen. So by heating ethanol with an oxidizing agent, remember an oxidizing agent is itself reduced, but it oxidizes another species, such as acidified potassium dichromate, we can also produce ethanoic acid. So in the reaction potassium dichromate, which is orange, when it is reduced, right, the color will change from orange to green. In the reaction with potassium dichromate, which has an orange color originally, when it undergoes a reduction process, the color change from orange to green. So it means to say that uh, alcohol was present. Right? Um, they use this process to help identify um, the old breathalyzer method of them identifying whether someone has alcohol in their um, breath. They would use um, potassium dichromate as a means of trying to identify the presence of alcohol. Right, of course, things are more digital now, right, as time has progressed. So what are the properties of ethanoic acid? It is a weak acid as only 1% of the ethanoic acid is ionized, right? Now, weak acids, if you go back um, to acids and bases, means that there are sm only, there's only partial ionization, not complete ionization. So only some ions, some H plus ions, uh, move from its atomic state to its ionic state, and not all of them are converted, right? So it's a weak acid as only 1% of the ethanoic acid is ionized. Now, when we talk about the word ionized, it's the formation of ions. Ionization is the formation of ions. So ethanoic acid is a weak acid. It does all the reactions just like other mineral acids, but more slowly. So they behave similar to mineral acids. And the reaction with alcohols forms sweet smelling liquids called esters. So they're telling you that esters smell sweet. Right? When an alcohol reacts with an acid, we have the formation of an ester plus water. All right. We have the formation of an ester plus water. So I have an next video here for you to
Carboxylic acids are found widely in nature. Here are three examples. First up, methanoic acid. Methanoic acid is commonly called formic acid, from the Latin for ant, formica, as it is the compound red ants inject into their prey. It was first isolated by distilling red ants. Secondly, ethanoic acid. Ethanoic acid is commonly called acetic acid, from the Latin acetum, meaning sour wine. This is because wine, which is a solution of ethanol, is oxidized in the air to ethanoic acid. Vinegar is a dilute solution of ethanoic, acetic acid. Then, ethane dioic acid. Ethane dioic acid, commonly called oxalic acid, is toxic and is found in rhubarb leaves, and that is why we should never eat them. Carboxylic acids contain the carboxyl group, as shown in the video. This is made up of a carbonyl group and a hydroxyl group. Let's have a look at the reactions of carboxylic acids. Carboxylic acids react as typical acids. These are number one, acid plus metal goes to salt plus hydrogen. For example, ethanoic acid plus sodium to sodium ethanoate and hydrogen. Number two, acid and base goes to salt plus water. For example, ethanoic acid and sodium hydroxide become sodium ethanoate and water. And three, acid plus carbonate go to salt plus carbon dioxide plus water. For example, ethanoic acid and sodium carbonate to sodium ethanoate, carbon dioxide and water. Carboxylic acids also give another important reaction called esterification. Here they react with alcohols to give an ester plus water. An example is ethanoic acid and ethanol to ethyl ethanoate and water. This is a reversible reaction, which can be seen from the directions of the two arrows shown. In this reaction, a few drops of concentrated sulfuric acid are added. This sulfuric acid acts as both a catalyst and to remove the water formed, thereby displacing the equilibrium to the right following Le Chatelier's principle. If you don't know this principle yet, no problem. We have a video about it right here, just for you. Now, let's take a look at what esters are actually used for. Esters have characteristic smells and are responsible for the flavour of foods and smell of flowers. They are therefore useful as flavourings and perfumes. Some examples of esters together with their smells are 3-methylbutylethanoate or bananas, pentylethanoate, pears, and octylethanoate, oranges. Animal fats, vegetable fats and oils are esters of long-chain fatty acids and glycerol. A soap is a salt of a fatty acid. Check out our water and soap video. So, to recap, carboxylic acids contain the carboxyl group. They show the typical reactions of acid. With alcohols, they undergo esterification to produce esters and esters are used in the catering and cosmetic industries. All right, so before we move forward, um, there's something that was mentioned in that short clip where he talked about Le Chatelier's principle. Now, uh, for your examination purposes, you will not need to know Le Chatelier's principle, but just for um, understanding and just for our general knowledge, I will tell you what Le Chatelier's principle is. And this principle is very simple. And it says that when a system is subjected to a constraint, that system will respond so as to move the effect of the constraint. So if something is added to the reactant side, the reaction will respond so as to remove that effect to produce more on the product side. 
If something is added to the product side, the reactant will respond so as to shift the um, system back over onto the reactant side to remove the e effect of the um, component that was added. So it is simply saying that whenever a system is subject to a constraint, the system will respond to remove the effect of that constraint, right? Every time a system is subjected to a constraint, it responds to remove the effect. Whether it is shifting to the left or shifting to the right, that equilibrium in the system is going to shift so that it remains in balance and stay constant. Hello everyone and welcome to another Simple Science video. And in this video, we're going to be looking at carboxylic acids in our IGCSE organic chemistry series. So carboxylic acids are just another type of organic molecules in IGCSE chemistry. And they are just another type of homologous series. They are inherently acids. And just like how we analyzed and studied organic molecules, we're going to be looking at uh, carboxylic acids groups uh, in, uh, with special regard to its functional group. And this functional group of the carboxylic acids is known as the carboxyl functional group. And it is responsible for the reactions and the properties of the carboxylic acid. Okay, and this um, carboxyl functional group is the COH group that I've highlight, highlighted here. It consists of uh, two oxygen atoms and hy hydrogen atom and all of them are bonded to a carbon atom. So these two oxygen atoms are bonded together differently in that one oxygen atom is double bonded to a carbon atom and a another oxygen atom is bonded via a OH group to that same carbon atom, okay? So let's look at the general formula for this type of organic molecule. So it's uh, I've isolated the COH functional group separately in this uh, general formula, so it's much clearer. So as a result, the general formula is CN minus 1, H2N one plus 1, COH, whereby N is the number of carbon molecules. And COH is, again, uh, identified separately. And just like any other organic molecule, the name of the molecule is... Uh, based on the number of carbons within that molecule. So we have methanoic acid of one and butanoic acid of four, for example. And just like any other uh, organic molecule, uh, there are versions of it, such as branches, multiple branches. So in this case, we have a methyl branch attached to a main carbon chain of a propanoic acid molecule. So we have the name of this molecule as methyl propanoic acid. So as I said before, the carboxyl group, functional group of the carboxylic acid is responsible for the properties of the acid and also the reaction. So let's first look at the physical properties of this type of organic molecule. So it has a high boiling point, higher than most other compounds of the same number of carbons. So um, this is generally responsible. Uh, what is generally responsible for this is the hydrogen bonding, which you will learn later at A level. Okay, and that is responsible for the high boiling point that keeps these uh, uh, molecules together. In addition, they're also very soluble, and this is also due to hydrogen bonding, uh, which is responsible for its solubility, uh, specifically in water. But this uh, solubility does decrease with size. Or in other words, the carbon length or the number of carbons or just generally the molecular mass of this molecule. Okay, so this functional carboxyl group is also responsible for the reactions of carboxylic acids and uh, the types of reactions that the carboxylic acid can undergo predominantly is first of all acid reactions they are acids inherently uh, as implied by their name and another type of reaction known as esterification okay so let's first look at the first type of reaction known as the acid reaction so carboxylic acids are inherently acids they are very weak acids however they only partially dissociate into ions okay so that results in a ph of less than seven so nothing compared to the very low ph's of uh acids such as strong acids such as hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid so in other words they only partially dissociate into ions so we have this 
on top the carboxylic acid molecule and they only very partially dissociate as implied by the equilibrium ion uh, equilibrium icon which shows that there are two possible states in which this um, this carboxylic acid can exist so as a full molecule or dissociate into a negative uh, in this case ethanoate ion and a positive uh, positive hydrogen ion okay so that just shows the partial dissociation of this uh, organic molecule so acid reactions what kind of acids reactions do they take, uh, can take place so uh, carboxylic acids can undergo the same types of acid reactions as pretty much any particular acid okay so in this case we have an acid reaction of uh, ethanoic acid and a metal so in this case potassium and as a result the product that is produced is potassium ethanoate whereby the negative ethanoate as, uh, ion from the eth ethanoic acid combines with the positive potassium ion and uh, that forms the potassium ethanoate um, uh, substance and also produces hydrogen okay and it can also undergo other types of acid reactions like nor a normal acid such as uh, reacting with bases such as oxides to form a salt and water so we know an acid can react with the bases to form salt and water and also reacts with a carbonate to form salt water and carbon dioxide so just like how uh, sulfuric acid or hydrochloric acid may react with carbon uh, sorry calcium carbonate okay so it, it is an acid basically and uh, the other type of reaction that it can undergo is esterification in other words the, the the production of esters okay and this is basically when a carboxylic acid reacts with an alcohol so the product of this reaction is an ester uh, that basically has attributes from both the ethanoic acid and the alcohol so uh, this type of ester uh, gets uh, the the carbon chains from both the ethanoic acid and the alcohol whereby uh, this name is propyl ethanoate why propyl propyl comes from the number of um, carbons from the alcohol side and ethanoate comes from the number of carbons on the ethanoic acid side okay so what happens in this reaction is that uh, from the carboxylic acid, the, an OH group is removed, and from the alcohol, a H group is removed. So, as a result, what is left will combine with each other to form an ester of propyl ethanoate, and the uh, what is removed is com uh, combined with each other to form water. Okay, so when a carboxylic acid reacts with an alcohol, it produces an ester and a water and ester is the type of uh, combined molecule shown there okay and an ester contains a COO functional group as highlighted there so this is another type of organic molecule and they're ad very easily identified by their you know their uh, it, it, they smell very good okay so esters are used prominently as perfumes or they can be used as solvents okay so I've covered uh, carboxylic acids the theory and um, types of reactions they undergo the products and uh, if you have any particular questions or any types of videos that you uh, want to request please feel free to leave them in the comments and I'll, I'll try my best to uh, make, make it up to you guys and uh, I wish you guys the very best in your revision and in your studies and um, uh, see you again very, very soon. Hello, everyone. All right. So that basically is the, the long and short of carboxylic acids. Now, I haven't put together any questions for you guys yet on carboxylic acids. I can, but in the interest of the things that we want to cover today, um, I did not. All right. So the next thing that I want us to look at is macromolecules. Macromolecules is the next thing that I want us to look at.
A polymer is a macromolecule, or a large molecule made of many repeating monomer subunits. We can think of the monomers as beads, link them up to form a necklace, the polymer. Let's have a look at this potato plant right here. Notice how it is standing upright without any support. This is due to a polymer known as cellulose. To be correct, this is a polysaccharide, a polymer made of many repeating sugar, or specifically, glucose subunits. Now layer all these polymers that you have formed. It is an even stronger structure. Now add more and intertwine them. This is the main component of plant cell walls. So now you can see why the stem of your potato plant can stay upright. Let's now look at the potato itself. It is very starchy. Starch is actually a combination of amylose and amylopectin. Amylose is also made of glucose monomers and has a helical structure. Amylopectin, on the other hand, is like amylose, but has branches of glucose chains. Have a look at that tree in the background. The trunk is very, very rigid and strong. It can't just be due to the cellulose, or else the stem of the potato plant would be much stronger. The reason why it is rigid is because the cellulose and other fibers are held intact by another natural polymer called lignin. Here is a challenge for you. Where do we get paper from? Pause, think, and resume the lesson when ready. Paper comes from wood, which come from trees. Paper is in fact made from cellulose, it is just layers of cross-linked cellulose fibers. If you tear a piece of paper and look closely, you will see those fibers. When paper is made, lignin must be separated from cellulose in a process called pulping, or else we would not be able to fold or crumple it. Now, let's look at ourselves. So what exactly makes us what we are? DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is a polymer of nucleotides. Each nucleotide is made of a sugar, a nitrogenous base, and two or three phosphate groups. Our DNA is the genetic blueprint of what we are. There are only four nucleic acids that form our DNA, yet the possibilities of arranging these monomers are virtually endless. A section of DNA that codes for a protein is known as a gene. Our genes determine whether we have brown or blue eyes, blonde or black hair, straight or curly hair, and even the smaller features, such as your dimples and the shape of the hairline. Genes are necessary to make all the enzymes needed to carry out the reactions in our bodies. Proteins are polymers made from amino acid monomers. There are endless types of proteins, each with a unique structure and function. Breathe in. Oxygen is transported through your blood by a protein called hemoglobin. As you inhaled, your chest rose. This was made possible by your chest muscles. Your muscles are a collection of muscle cells, which are rich in protein chains or filaments. Feel the top of your ear. The hard yet flexible part is cartilage, which is also a type of protein. This cartilage is also found in joints. It makes it possible to move our arms and legs. Feel the tip of your nose. It is also made of cartilage. Collagen is a fibrous protein responsible for maintaining the firmness of our skin. As time progresses, the collagen loses its elasticity, just like an overused elastic band. When this happens, grooves in our skin form, otherwise known as wrinkles. Hair and nails are made of keratin, yet another type of protein. Keratin is not exclusive to humans, but is also found in bird feathers, turtle shells, and cat claws. Moving on to other living organisms, silkworms can produce their own silk protein to spin its cocoon. 
This is still done on a large scale in some countries. However, some people find this unethical as the larvae inside the cocoon are killed during this process. The exoskeleton or shells of crustaceans, such as crabs and lobsters, are formed from chitin. Chitin is a polymer made of repeating N-acetylglucosamine monomer subunits whose structure is derived from glucose. Interestingly enough, chitin is also found in the cell walls of fungi, most notably mushrooms. Natural rubber is also a polymer of isoprene monomer subunits. This is found in latex, which is a white milky substance that is tapped from para rubber trees. This can be used to make latex gloves, erasers, elastic bands, adhesive, and balloons, as well as many other useful everyday materials. The rubber in car tires is vulcanized rubber, meaning that sulfur has been added to introduce cross-linking between the polymers, which strengthens the structure. To summarize, there are many natural polymers, each with their own specific structure and function. In this lesson, you will learn about synthetic polymers. Unlike natural polymers, these polymers are made by humans in a factory instead of within a living organism. You are likely familiar with the term plastics. This is a broad term encompassing a wide range of polymers made of monomers derived from crude oil. Crude oil is known as a non-renewable resource because we cannot grow or produce crude oil. The fractions obtained from the fractional distillation of crude oil can be cracked to form alkenes, some of which are the monomers of these synthetic polymers. For example, polyethene, also known as polyethylene, is a polymer of ethene monomers. These polyethene polymers can be high or low density, all depending on the degree of branching present. The term branch refers to smaller chains sticking out of the main chain, much like branches on a tree. Polypropene or polypropylene is a polymer of propene monomers. Polyvinyl chloride or PVC is a polymer of chloroethene or vinyl chloride monomers. Can you predict the name of the monomer of polytetrafluoroethylene, PTFE? Pause, think, and resume when ready. The answer is tetrafluoroethylene. Polystyrene is synthesized from the polymerization of styrene monomers. You may have encountered polystyrene as white cups in food packaging materials. Expanded polystyrene is used in packaging and shipping, so to protect the contents from being damaged. Since our other videos discuss these synthetic polymers and their uses in great detail, we will focus on other useful synthetic polymers. Regular school glue or PVA glue is polyvinyl acetate, a synthetic polymer made from repeating units of vinyl acetate monomers. When you lick a stamp to stick it on an envelope, and when you lick the edges of the envelope to seal it, that sticky part is actually made of polyvinyl acetate. Ethyl cyanoacrylic polymerizes to form a very strong adhesive, much stronger than PVA glue. This very strong glue is known as superglue. Soft drink bottles are made of polyethylene terephthalate. If you look near the bottom of the bottle, you will see this sign. This means that it can be recycled, which means that it can be broken apart into their respective monomers, 
and polymerized once again. This is important because it reduces the amount of waste in landfills. Imagine if these synthetic polymers could not be recycled. All the soft drink bottle waste, plastic containers, and certain packaging materials would just accumulate. With the global population expanding at an exponential rate, without a good recycling scheme in place, this could become a very serious environmental and social issue. An increasingly important synthetic polymer is polylactic acid, or PLA, used to make plastic cups and other packaging materials. This is a polymer of lactic acid, which is obtained from the bacterial fermentation of carbohydrates. These sugars can come from corn or sugarcane, all of which are renewable resources because they can be grown again and again. If you exercise for an extended amount of time, your muscles begin to cramp. This is due to the production of lactic acid from insufficient oxygen in your muscle cells. Besides being derived from a renewable resource, PLA is also biodegradable. In other words, it can break down naturally. PLA is sometimes used in the medical field as dissolvable stitches. If you had to get stitches, you wouldn't have to return to the clinic or hospital to have them removed because they biodegrade naturally over time. Another synthetic polymer with this real-life application is polyglycolic acid. Imagine if we can one day dispose a food container in our garden and find that it has decomposed in a few days. Imagine if we can recycle a soft drink bottle in our own home. The possibilities are endless, all with the intent to reduce the impact of mass production of waste on our planet. In summary, there are many synthetic polymers with many real-life applications, and in particular, there is an increased interest in recyclable and biodegradable synthetic polymers. All right, so that was just for us to see an overview of what macromolecules is all about and what we intend to talk about for the next a couple of minutes. Now, the word macro means that we are dealing with large molecules, right? Macro is large, micro is small. So when we speak of macromolecules, they are built up from small units and the small units are referred to as monomers, right? Mono meaning that it is one. The word mono refers to one unit. Now, there's an a, a equation right below where we have ethanoic acid reacting with ethanol in the presence of concentrated sulfuric acid. And that is giving us ethyl ethanoate, which is the ester plus water. Right? Now, different macromolecules have different units and or different linkages. So what am I saying? Depending on which macromolecule we are dealing with, it will determine what the subunit or the monomer is, and it will also determine what type of linkages we are dealing with. So for example, um, if I have glucose, glucose can be a, a, sub, a small unit or a monomer, and the larger unit could be a polysaccharide because glucose tells us that we are dealing with a sugar and the scientific name for sugar is saccharide. So if I have a polysaccharide, it means I have a complex sugar, right? And that would be the macromolecule. Yes, that is the big structure that is derived from the glucose unit. Uh, the linkage, you could have linkage, you could have amide linkages, you could have ester linkages. Um, another small unit is an amino acid. The amino acid is the small unit that makes up proteins. I have fatty acids and glycerol. 
many fatty acids and glycerol make up lipids or fats and so on. So the uses and the different structures involved. Now I want you to see the pattern that begins to emerge when we when I go through the different um, types of polymers and the structure that is produced from it, right? So polythene or polyethene, as you would know it, plastic bags, you, you come across it all the time, those gloves, right? Uh, cling flim, your mugs, your bowls, your chairs, your plastic chairs, dustbins, um, and so on. These are some of the uses of polyethene. Now, how is polythene or polyethene obtained? It comes from ethene. Now, if you recognize, all they did was add the word poly in front of it. So it becomes polyethene or polythene, which is another name for the same thing. But the word poly only tells us that there are many units. That is what poly is telling us, that there are many units. Many units of what? There are many of these units being repeated. Now, what has happened? The double bond in this is broken. As you can see, there's only a single bond here. And this unit now is what is repeated over and over and over, hence making it polyethene. So even though there's a single bond present, it is still the alkene that we are dealing with because we are talking about polymers. All right, so from the ethene, we got polyethene. So let's go on to the next one. We have PVC, polyvinyl chloride, or polychlorothene, or chloroethene, as you would know it. Um, how do we use it? For our water lines, Wasser use it a lot in order for you to get water in your house. You have those PVC lines running inside, right? Um, it's also used for hoses, um, for coverings, for of electrical cables. They use PVC to help create those things. Now, how did we get the PVC? Polychloroethene. It would have come from the chloroethene. Now, if you notice. The only difference between this word and this word is the presence of the word poly. Meaning there are many of this unit being repeated. And all that they did was they broke the double bond. Everything else is the same. It still have hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen. It still have that. But the only thing that has changed is the double bond has now become a single bond. And this unit is repeated over and over and over, creating PVC. All right, the next is polypropene. Right, the making of crates and ropes is one of the uses of polypropene. So how would we have gotten polypropene? Again, the double bond has been broken, and prop meaning that we deliver three carbons, one carbon, two carbon, three carbon. So it's propene because we are dealing with the poly, the polymer, and it's poly because there are n repeated number of units. N could be 5, 10, 15, 20, 400, 500. Right, N is the number of repeated units. And how would they have gotten it? From the monomer propene. This here is the unit that is being repeated over and over and over. All that happens is that that double bond is broken and we have the repeated unit as seen on this side here. All right, next we have polystyrene or polystyrene or polyphenylethene. 
right? Which is another way of naming the same uh, compound. And the question is, how did we come up with the name and where did it come from? We have phenyl ethylene. And if you recognize, all they did was add the word poly in front of it, giving them poly phenyl et e polyphenyl ethene right we have six carbons here seven eight carbons so in total they have eight carbons right this here is giving us that phenyl group so this is the phenyl uh the et represents the two carbons that we have here so we have phenyl ethene and that is polyphenyl ethene um, there's another way I could have named it. I have six, seven, eight. I could have just named, checked it as eight carbons, and it would have been octene, and it would have been polyoctene if I wanted to name it that way as well. That technically would also be um, correct given the number of carbons and hydrogens present inside of the structure, right? But how they commonly name it is polyphenyl ethene right and it would have come from the monomer phenyl ethene right where they remove that poly from in front here and that would tell us the monomer that we started off with all right next is teflon right now teflon is coated on frying pans to make them non-stick fabric protectors and windscreen wipers, as well as on florins. And PTFE, or Teflon as you would know it, the scientific name is really polytetrafluoroethene. Polytetrafluoroethene, right? Now, why is it tetrafluoroethene? Tetra means four. Fluoro means the presence of fluorine. So I have one, two, three, four fluorine uh, atoms that are added, and tetra represents four. So I have tetrafluoro, I have two carbons, meaning to say that it's et, and ene tells us that it's an alkene, and it's poly tetrafluoroethene. Poly meaning that this unit is being repeated many times, n number of times it is repeated. N could be five, N could be six, N could be 10, N could be 100, poly tetrafluoroethene, which is Teflon. Now, where would we have gotten Teflon from? What is the monomer unit that produces Teflon? Check over here. Tetrafluoroethene, all they did was add the word poly in front of it. All right? So, poly, it would have come from this monomer unit where this bond here has been broken and that unit is repeated over and over and over. All right, so next we have is the making of nylon. Nylon is used to make ropes, fisher nets and lines, tents, curtains and so on. So what are the monomers that we use to make nylon now you've heard of nylon string then people go fishing they take the line nylon and they put it on and they to get the fishing line or the fishing rod as they would call it but what was that created from so let's take a look at some of the structures that we have here and see what that was created from just one second All right now here we have one six diamino hexane one six diamino hexane now what is that telling us is that here i have one amine group and over here i have another amine group an amine group is a nh2 group so when they say one six diamino one meaning it's on the first carbon 
six minutes on the six carbon. Di meaning there are two of them. Amino meaning that I have the amine group on the first carbon and on the six carbon. Hexane, there are no double bonds and there are six carbons present. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hence, I have one, six, diamino, hexane. That's the first structure. Now, next, I have a next structure. And this structure now is hexan 16 diol chloride. Hexa 16 diol chloride. Now, let's see why it's that. Hexan, hex because there are six carbons. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So there are six carbons, hence hex. There are no double bonds, so it should have been hexane. But hexan, one, six, diol. So I have C double bond O on Cl on the sixth carbon and C double bond O Cl on the first carbon. Hence, it's dioil chloride. OIL telling us that it is C double bonded O. The chloride telling us that it's also bonded to the chlorine. So I have hexa 16 dioil chloride. All right, so let's come back a little bit. So next, so what is happening when this reaction takes place? Basically, they're telling you that um, these two structures are monomers and one of the hydrogens from the first structure, E, um, and the chlorine from the second structure, B, is removed so in essence i am saying that in order for me to get the uh, repeated unit hydrogen got to go and chlorine got to go so i end up with hcl being removed but what that does now is where h and cl was you have now there a, a, a new bond being formed because here all I am left with is nitrogen and hydrogen, and over here I'm left with C double bond O. Right? If you look at it clearly, if H and Cl are removed, all I am left with is C double bond O on one side and NH on the next side. The two of them then binds together and we have the formation of what is called a peptide bond. N, a bonded to H, bonded to C, double bonded to O. And this structure here is called a peptide bond, which is the same structure that we see on this side here, which is the formation of a peptide bond. So hydrogen, and chlorine is removed to produce hydrochloric acid that is removed. But this compound A and B now binds together and this unit is repeated over and over and over to give me what we call nylon, right? This is one monomer unit and this is another monomer unit mono meaning one unit they come and they bind together and we have the formation of a polymer right and in this case the name of the polymer that is formed is nylon right so no double bonds breaks instead single bond breaks and new single bond forms in this case the monomers are able to join to each other by eliminating a small molecule, in our instance, the molecule here that was eliminated was hydrochloric acid. 
HCl. This reaction continues at each of the two monomers. So thousands of molecules join together to give a macromolecule. So in essence, this is repeated over and over where you have A, and then you have B, and then you have A, and then you have B. Right? And again, if you look closely, you can see that NHC double bond O, that, that linkage, which is called a peptide linkage, is repeated over and over. A peptide or amide linkage is repeated over and over and over. NHC double bond O. That is the unit that is repeated over and over and over. So this year, up till we have NH, the C double bond O. This is one unit here. This is another A and B. So up to here is one unit. And then you have NH of the C double bond O. This here to here. This is a second unit. So right here, what we have is two units of nylon. Right? So this is more than one. Two of them come together, and this is repeated over and over and over for us to get the formation of what is called nylon. All right, so let's look at something else. Terylene. Terylene, the making of terylene. How is it used? It's used in clothing, especially mixed with cotton thread, right? So we're looking at some monomers. And you tell yourself, look at the structure, how they expect me to know that. I'm not expecting you to know that. But what I want you to see is how they came up with the name and then how the two molecules came together to give you the polymer. That's what I want you to see, right? Let's look past the complicated structure as it looks and see exactly what they're trying to show us. So this ring right in the middle here can be represented another way. Right? And I'm going to try to draw the structure up here for you as to how it can be represented. It's normally drawn something similar to this and is normally called benzene. Right? It's normally drawn like this or it's called benzene, another way it is drawn. Where you have alternating double bonds, right? And again, the same structure is called benzene. So there are three double bonds present inside the structure, or they put it as a circle to show that the bonds are revolving, right? But it's the same structure that they have here. So this ring structure, which is a six carbon ring structure, one, two, three, four, five, and six, this six carbon structure is what is called benzene. So they have benzene, one, four, dicarboxylic acid. This is telling us that on the first carbon and on the fourth carbon, we have a carboxylic acid group, right? Hence the word di. So there are two carboxylic acid groups. This is C double bond O, OH. This is one carboxylic acid group. And then this is C double bond OOH. This is the second carboxylic acid group. So on the first carbon and on the fourth carbon, they have a carboxylic acid group. Hence, it is a dicarboxylic acid. Hence, the name is benzene 1,4 dicarboxylic acid. Because a carboxylic acid group is on the first carbon, and then there's also another carboxylic acid group on the fourth carbon. All right, so that's the first thing that I want you to see. Now, next on the next side, we have ethane 1, 2, diol. They have ethane 1, 2, diol. Now, so this here should have been an H. All right, they have CL. This here should have been H, not CL. If that's the name, this should be a H. Ethene 1,2-diol. So this is 
met at we have two carbons right the two carbons tells us that we are dealing with et hence et in meaning that there are no double bonds so it's an alkene hence we have etene they have one two this so there's something on the first carbon and then there's something on the second carbon and they have a diol ol represents the presence of a oh group so it means to say that there's the presence of a oh group but if i have di ol or diol it means i have two di represents the presence of two so i have two oh group present so that is telling me that i have an oh group here and an oh group there hence the name is ethane one two diol so I have one name as benzene one for dicarboxylic acid. And on the next side, I have ethane one to diol. And these structures are going to come together now to react. So let's see how this reaction is going to play out for us. All right, now we have what is going to happen. So this here is just to simplify the structure. So instead of putting the ring structure, that ring structure is now represented by um, this box that is in red, and this here, instead of putting the carbon carbon chain, right? This is now represented by this yellow box here. So this box represents that benzene ring, and this box here represents the um, ethene um, bond. Now on either side, you're still seeing that they have the carboxylic acid on this side. And they still have the carboxylic acid on this side. I want you to see that. However, water is being removed. The H from the diol is being removed. And the OH from the acid, the diacid, is being removed. So I have the removal of H2O, two hydrogens and an oxygen. H2O has been removed. So what I am left with is carbon double bonded on this side and oxygen bonded on this side so if you look on the product side now what is now formed there is the carbon double bonded now comes and link with the oxygen that remaining give me c double bond o, o and i have the formation of a ester All right i have the formation of a ester linkage where on one side I still have the carboxylic acid functional group and on the next side I still have the alcohol functional group but in the middle water has been removed and an ester linkage has been formed water has been removed and an ester linkage has been formed so the monomers which were the individual units all right they join by the elimination or eliminating a water molecule and this unit is now going to be repeated over and over and over to give the macromolecule or to give the polymer, right? This is going to be repeated over and over and over to give that macromolecule or that big structure, right? That's going to be repeated over and over. So let me just go back one more. We're talking about making terylene. Terylene is created from benzene 1,4 dicarboxylic acid and ethane 1,2 diol. Remember, this is supposed to be a H, not chlorine. Right? Benzene 1,4 dicarboxylic acid plus ethane 1,2 diol. This reaction on either side, we have a carboxylic acid, carboxylic acid. On either side, we have an OH group, OH group. They come together water is removed so hydrogen from here is going to be removed and the oh group from here is going to be removed and then i'm going to have the, the bonding of the oxygen to the carbon there so c double bond o, o is what is going to be formed and i end up with a ester group forming right which is c double bond o o right and that is the ester linkage that bonds one group on one side to the another group. And this structure that is now formed from them is what is going to be repeated over and over. That structure that is formed 
is repeated over and over and over. So what is the unit that is repeated? The C double bond O to this um, structure here. This unit is being repeated over and over and over. So there's a second one here bonded to O. And that unit is being repeated over and over and over. So what is there? There is what is called a ester linkage, where I have C double bond O bonded to oxygen. Right, C double bond O bonded to oxygen. All right. So any question on that, guys, so far? Does that make sense? Or is that confusing? All right. Uh, moving on, the next thing, all right, thank you for that. The next thing is the, we're going to look at is pollution from plastics. Now, as you and I both know, we know that plastic is something once created, we cannot get rid of it. It's, it stays in, in the um, environment for a long period of time. And that is a problem for us, right? It results in um, marine uh, organisms misrepresenting or, or seeing the plastic as food and trying to consume it. And then they end up choking to death or uh, getting caught in it or stuck in it and stuff like that, which affects them. So plastics, um, birds choke on plastic, fish and other animals try to eat it, right? Um, or they, they fill up the animal's stomach so that they cannot eat proper food. And then the animals starve to death because their their um, system is unable to break down the plastic. Right? Um, the next thing that plastic does, well, we know that in Trinidad and Tobago, it clogs up the drains and the sewer, and it causes flooding to take, split, to take place. Right? They collect in rivers, and they get in the way of fish. Right? Some riverbeds now contain a thick layer of plastic Right, um, the plastic blow into the trees and onto the beaches, and it makes the place look a mess. And then tourists tend to go elsewhere and other places. So right now, because of the, the coronavirus, a lot of people are forced to stay indoors, right? And there's less pollution taking place because people are not outside as before and littering the place as they used to, right? So Mother Nature is getting a chance to purge itself a little. All right, which is one of the positives we could see from all the, the gloom that is happening amongst us. All right, so we have two types, basic types of macromolecules that we deal with. We have those natural macromolecules, and then we have the synthetic macromolecules. Natural meaning that it appears in nature naturally, right? Synthetic means that man found a way to create it and then it exists, right? So the food that we consume, the food's main constituents are proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. These are natural macromolecules. Proteins contain the same linkages, amide linkages, or peptide linkages as nylon, but with different units. So when I speak of that amide linkage, I'm talking about the C double bond O, NH, this link right here. C double bond O, NH, this is the amide linkage. So in digestion, proteins are broken down into amino acids by a process of hydrolysis. Right? Proteins are broken down into amino acids. So it means to say that one amino acid comes and binds to another amino acid and we have the formation of a peptide. So if we have a peptide being formed, if we have many peptide units, we will have what is called a polypeptide, right? That's how we came up with it. The polypeptide is because many peptide linkages 
come together and give us a polypeptide. If you refer to it as an amide linkage, many amide links would come together and we'll end up with a polyamide. We are speaking of the same thing, right? A polypeptide or a polyamide helps give us that same structure that we are dealing with. Right? So proteins is a natural macromolecule. Next, we have fats. Fats are esters possessing the same linkage as terylene, which is the ester linkage. The ester linkage is C double bond O bonded to oxygen. All right? Fats have this linkage, which is an ester linkage. Hence, if I have many ester links, I will end up with what is called a polyester. If I have many ester links, I can end up with a polyester. So fats are esters possessing the same linkage as terylene. Right? Now, if you could remember what terylene was, just to go back a couple of slides. Right? If you remember what the terylene was, it's simply telling us that terylene had, was made from the benzene 1 4 dicarboxylic acid and the ethane 1 2 diol. Right? That's what it was made from. And it produced the ester linkage, C double bond O, OH, right? The ester linkage was produced. So soap is a product of the hydrolysis or the hydrolysis of fats, right? Or the, the, the hydrolysis is the split Lysis is to split hydro to split by the presence of water. So it is done using sodium hydroxide as opposed to acid, right? The process of making soap, they use sodium hydroxide as opposed to acid in digestion. In digestion, an acid is used in the hydrolysis process, but with soaps, sodium hydroxide is used. The hydrolysis gives glycerol and the sodium salt of fatty acids, right? When we hydrolyze it, it gives us glycerol and the sodium salt of fatty acids, right? And the salts are used as soaps, right? So in a subsequent video, when we are going to um, saponification, which is the making of soaps, we will understand in further detail how this process happens and what happens to the, um, the fatty acid and glycerol and how it produces soap when the reaction takes place. Right? But for now, fats, we are talking about one of the natural macromolecules. Next, we have carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are complex carbohydrates and macromolecules. The simple carbohydrates is your glucose, right? Glucose is a simple sugar because it is a saccharide and it is a monosaccharide because it is one sugar unit, right? So if I have many sugar units, I have a polysaccharide. If I have two sugar units, I have a disaccharide. If I have four sugar units, I have a tetrasaccharide or a polysaccharide. I have many units. All right. So you don't hear them saying about a trisaccharide and tetrasaccharide. What you would hear is monosaccharide, disaccharide, and polysaccharide. Okay. So these sugar units, um, for examination purposes and for simplification of understanding, is normally represented by something that looks like this. All right. OH on either side with a box in the middle. Some books, instead of putting a box, puts a structure that look like that bonded to OH on either side. Right? Some actually draw out the actual structure as to how it's supposed to look. Right? It looks like a hexagon. And then bonded to it on either side is the OH again. Either of these structures are correct if you were to use any of them. But for simplicity, we're going to just use OH for the uh, rectangular looking box bonded to OH. 
right? So this here represents a, sing a simple sugar unit. They join together in a condensation polymerization reaction. Now, condensation means water is being removed. Polymerization means that a polymer is being formed. So water is being removed to form a polymer. So if I had many of these units and I had another OH group here, bonded to another glucose unit, and they were in close proximity like this. In essence, they're telling you that hydrogen from this unit and OH from this unit is being removed. So water is being removed. H2O is being removed. When water is removed, all that is left is just oxygen. So therefore, it comes and it binds, as in the diagram seen below here, it comes and it binds together. And as it binds, it results Yes, so it binds, and when it binds, it results in just the um, oxygen linking one glucose unit to the next glucose unit. And this is a, well, at the advanced level, they would call it a glycosidic bond, right? At this level, we don't need to know that, but that is the bond that links one glucose unit to another glucose unit. Right, one is linked to the other. So they join together in a condensation polymerization reaction where water is removed. So here H2O is removed. Here H2O is removed. And if I keep having more of the units, more and more water is going to be removed. And I will have a long chain um, macromolecule, and we would call that molecule starch, right? That's what we will call that molecule. So in digestion, the hydrolysis or the composition of a chemical compound by the reaction with water of starch happens in the mouth by the enzyme amylase to make glucose. So they are telling you, when we talk of hydrolysis, we are splitting by the removal of water, right? So we remove water and then we cause um, polymerization to take place because a single unit is now going to be repeated multiple times over and over and over and over, right? And what it results in is the formation of a polymer, right? In this instance, it is starch. And when we consume starch, right, for example, which is in the bread that we eat or the um, potato that you consume and stuff, that starch in it. That starch now can now be broken down by enzymes to give us back the glucose units, which is the initial units that it have up here. So the enzyme can break it down, but condensation polymerization can build it back up. All right. So hydrolysis, All right? If starch, in the presence of an enzyme is broken down, what it's gonna produce is glucose. If proteins in the presence of an enzyme, for example, trypsin is broken down, those of you doing biology, it would give us back amino acids because amino acids are the basic building blocks of proteins, right? Just how glucose is the basic building blocks of starch, amino acids are the basic building blocks of proteins. And fats, it gives us fatty acids and glycerol. So many fatty acids and glycerol can come together. And what it will give us is a lipid molecule or a fat molecule, as we would call it, right? But if hydrolysis is not complete, macromolecules are not completely broken down. So you could get a mixture of molecules of different sizes. So if this process does not happen completely, then we can have different macromolecules of different sizes, right? So this process, if it don't happen completely, you will get different macromolecules or different big molecules of different sizes. So identification, 
how can we identify them? How can we tell if they are present, right? Um, one way, chromatography can be used to identify some of these products and substances, right? Um, and in another video, I would show you how chromatography takes place, right? So you can make sense of that. Um, next, however, amino acids and sugars are colorless when dissolved in water. So a locating agent is used. So when we want to test to see if it have amino acids present in a sample or whether protein is present in a sample, we can perform the biurate test, or so the burate test as you call it. And when we want to test to see if sugars are present in a sample, we will perform Benedict's test. All right. Now, with if proteins are present, we normally get a mauve or purple color being produced. And if uh, sugars, reducing sugars are present, the sample would go and give an orange or brick red color from the reaction. Substances can be identified using retention factor values or by matching them with spots which are horizontal. Right? Um, this has to do with chromatography, um, and that you will get into at a later time. Right? But just for now, if we wanted to identify it, these are some ways that we could go about trying to identify the presence of it. Um, if we were to use amino acids, and if we had it on chromatography paper, we could use a, a locating agent to help us to identify it. Right? If they are present, we could find it on the chromatogram. If we want to see whether a sample does contain protein or not, we could do the Burea test. If we want to see whether it contains sugar or not, we could do the Benedict's test. If we want to find it on the chromatogram, we could use a locating agent if it is present, and then we could find the retention factor values of it. All right? Those are just some of the things if we're trying to identify it. So, what have we learned so far? Polymerization, we take one unit, which is what we call a monomer, and we produce a polymer by obtaining repeated units of that one unit, right? Repeated units of that one unit would give us what is called a polymer. So a monomer is a small molecule, whereas a polymer is a long chained version of that small molecule. So that small molecule is repeated over and over and over and over. Right? So when we have polymerization, that, mol that monomer unit forms linkages to produce that polymer unit, right? Which gives us uh, the formation of a polymer. And we would refer to this as polymerization. Right now, there are two types of polymerization. You could have addition polymerization when you're dealing with alkenes, right? You have addition polymerization because the double bond is broken and it is added across the double bond, right? Um, if you have condensation polymerization, it means to say that a molecule is being removed. Most times it's water, water is being removed because um condensation is taking place so condensation polymerization is one type and addition polymerization is the next type so um when do we get it addition polymerization if i have ethene and i want to get a polymer of ethene i could end up with polyethene where the double bond is broken and i have single bonds present in a repeated fashion The next, if I have condensation polymerization, I have two different monomer units that are coming together and they result in either an amide linkage or an ester linkage, right? With the amide linkage, that is C double bond O, NH, C double bond O, NH, and with the ester linkage, that is C double bond O, O. Right, so this is in short trying to simplify all that we have been talking about thus far. With the amide linkage, it's a C double bond O, NH bond, and with the ester linkage, it's a C double bond O, O bond. Right, with the amide linkage, we can have naturally occurring polymers, 
right? For example, proteins, um, carbohydrates, and your fats, right? These are naturally occurring uh, polymers. Uh, synthetic polymers are man-made polymers. Under our amide linkage, natural example of it with the amide linkage would be protein, right? Um, for the synthetic version, we have nylon. Under the ester link, naturally occurring would be fats. And under the synthetic version, terylene is an example of that ester linkage. All right, so moving on. So examples of addition polymers. So this I would have shown you before, but in a different um, diagram. The monomer would be the ethene, the polymer, the bond, double bond has been broken. There are only single bonds, as you can see now. There's only one bond here, only one bond, right? So with there only being one bond, that unit is now repeated and we end up with polyethene, right? What is it used for? It's used in plastic bags and bowls and creating buckets and so on, right? For um, the next one we have is propene. With propene, um, propene can be um, the bond, the double bond present in the propene is broken and it now has a single bond present and propene, that propene is now repeated. Now, mind you, it's a propane structure, right? Because if you talk across the head, um, whether we're dealing with a propane or alkene or alkene, it is an alkene structure, but it has the alkene name because it was derived from the alkene. That's what I want you to understand. It's an alkene structure because it, it was derived from the alkene, but the structure is an alkene, but it has the alkene name because it had a double bond and it's that unit that is being repeated over and over and over and over, right? That's what I want you to see. So yes, there are only single bonds present. So the polypropene, poly meaning many, where N would represent the number of units that are there to be repeated. Right? How is this useful? We use it in ropes and packaging and so on. Right? Then we have chloroethene. Right? Again, the double bond in chloroethene is broken and I end up with CC with hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen and chlorine. And that, is, that unit is repeated over and over to give me polychloroethene. Right, next we have tetrafluoroethene. The, again, the double bond is broken and we end up with um, fluorine, 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 fluorine bonded to two carbons. And that structure, that monomer structure unit is repeated n number of times to give us polytetrafluoroethene. Right, it is used in nonstick frying pans um, to help withstand high temperatures. And the next we have Phenylethene, right? Um, you have C2H123, and then you have C6H5, and the double bond again has been broken. There's no double bond present, but that unit is now repeated over and over and over. This is used in insulation packaging, right? So that gives us polyphenylethene. Right now, it's not any new information that I'm presenting to you, but just I'm going over that which we would have spoken about a while ago. So let's take a closer look at some of these things that we've been talking about. Right, um, with proteins, again, the amino acid is the basic building block of protein. The amino acid is the basic building block of a protein. On the amino acid, structure, I want you to notice a couple of things, right? On this side here, I have the amine group NH2, and on the next side, I have C double bond O, OH, right? I have an amine group on one side and a carboxylic acid group on the next side, if you could see that, right? And what is going to happen is that 
hydrogen from one side is going to be lost and the OH group from the other side is going to be removed and then another unit like this is comes and binds to it and that structure is now going to be repeated so I will end up with the structure I have CRC double bond O CRC double bond O and then I have NH NH and this structure here is going to be repeated over and over and over, right? Because water has been removed, H and OH, water has been removed, All right? The next thing we have, if you look at the nylon, again with nylon, dicarboxylic acid and a diamine comes together. Now, why is it a dicarboxylic acid? If I could remind you again, or if you could bring back to your remembrance, I have C double bond OOH on one side, and I have C double bond OOH on the opposite side, and the two of them come together. Right? On one side, the OH here is removed, and here the OH here is removed. On the next side, I have a diamine. So NH2, and of the NH2, one of the hydrogens is removed, leaving C double bond O NH. C double bond O NH. Coming and bind together, giving us that peptide linkage or that amide linkage. C double bond O NH. All right, C double bond O NH. And this unit now is repeated over and over and over. This here comes and is added to this on this side over here, right? And that, that is repeated over and over and over, giving us what we call nylon, which is our polymer. Now, mind you, this is the synthetic polymer, while the protein is the natural polymer. All right. Next we have fats, right? Now fat, the link here for the fats is C double bond OO. That's the ester linkage. C double bond OO, the ester linkage. Um, down here we have terylene. Terylene also results in the formation of the ester linkage, C double bond OO. Right, it also results in the formation of the ester linkage. C double bond OO. Water is removed, the dicarboxylic acid and the diol comes together. OH from the, the, the acid is removed, while hydrogen from the diol is removed. And that results in the formation of an ester link, right, which is C double bond OO. It results in the formation of an ester linkage. All right, guys, uh, we will end in about 15 minutes, just about 15 more minutes before we come to the end of this session. All right, next, right, food, the three main constituents of food that we eat. All right, um, I'm not presenting anything new thus far. I'm just uh, reiterating some things that you guys already know and trying to make some application to it. Um, the three main constituents of food, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, right? And these are your natural macromolecules, right? The production of carbohydrates, how is carbohydrates made? Um, it's normally made by the process of photosynthesis, right? Plants help in this process, they make carbohydrates. So for example, starch, starch is a carbohydrate. So six CO2 plus six H2O, to, in the presence of sunlight and chlorophyll will give you what is called C6H12O6, which is glucose plus oxygen gas. Glucose and oxygen gas, the process of photosynthesis helps to make or produce carbohydrates. All right? So the next thing, um, you could have the acid hydrolysis of it. Um, that's something we'll go into at another time. Um, and you can have the alkaline hydrolysis of fats, right? You can have the alkaline hydrolysis of fats, where fats 
is placed in the presence of sodium hydroxide, which is an alkali, in the presence of heat, and it gives you glycerol and fatty acids, right? Fatty acids and glycerol, that gives us the soap that we used to bathe with, right? The sodium from the sodium hydroxide binds with the fatty acid that is formed producing a salt, and that sodium salt of the carboxylic acid is what we use as a soap. All right, now, um, if we want to identify these products, the presence of a fat, of proteins or carbohydrates, um, with the proteins or carbohydrates, we can use chromatography to try to identify its presence, if we want to do that. All right, so we just went through that. Um, so let's take a look at a couple of things. Um, recapping again, macromolecules, these are large molecules built up from small units, monomers. Different macromolecules have different units and they have different linkages, right? That's, well, you have to know that you now know. So for example, glucose is a small unit and it can join together with other small units to make starch or to make cellulose right, which is a natural macromolecule, right? Other examples of macromolecules, um, diamond is an example, uh, graphite is an example of macromolecules, right? So example of small units, a glucose unit, an amino acid unit, fatty acid and glycerol units. These are examples of small units, right? Uh, the next example of linkages, we could have an amide linkage, and to remind you, the amide linkage is C N uh, C H and C A N N H, right? I enjoyed looking kind of weird, right? Um, and the ester, I could have the C double bond O. Oh, structures, All right? So the amide linkage and the ester linkage, just to go back so you can see it. All right, the amide linkage is the C double bond O on one side, and H, this is your amide linkage, and the ester linkage is C double bond O, O on the opposite side. So forgive my handwriting, how it's looking. I do apologize for that. All right, so with the ester linkage, let me try to do better. C double bond O, O. This is our ester linkage and our amide linkage, C double bond O, N, H. All right. So this here is our amide linkage, and this here is our ester linkage. All right. Next example of macromolecules, naturally existed macromolecules. You have your proteins, your starch, and your lipids. These are naturally occurring macromolecules. All right. Um, synthetic uh, macromolecules. Um, polymers, we have polythene, polychloroethene, polypropene, polystyrene, teflon, nylon, terylene. These are all examples of polymers, but these are not natural polymers. They are synthetic polymers, man-made polymers. Example of polythene is used in plastic bags, in gloves, in cling film, in mugs, in bowls, in chairs, dustbins, and so on with polychlorothene, um, water pipes, welling tons, hoses, um, covering of electrical cables. In polypropene, um, it's used in the making of crates as well as in ropes. With polystyrene, it's used as expanded polystyrene in fast food, carton, packaging, and insulation for roofs and walls. Teflon is used as a coating on fire frying pans to make them nonstick. 
Um, they're used as fabric protectors as well as, as it's used for windscreen wipers. Nylon is used for ropes, fishing nets, lines, um, tents and curtains. And terrelene is used in clothing, especially mixed with cotton and thread. Right? Those are just some examples of synthetic polymers and their uses. Right? We also stopped and we talked about pollution and the problem that comes from it as it relates to plastic. Right? We said birds choke on it, fish and other animals try to eat them, and it fills up the animal's stomach and makes it difficult for them to eat. They have problems with digestion and then they die from starvation. Right? Um, they clog up your drains and your sewers. They result in flooding. We have, we have seen that all over Trinidad and Tobago. They collect in your rivers. They get in the way of the fish. Right? Um, some beds are now covered with thick layers of plastic. Um, they blow um, onto the trees, onto the beaches. They make the place look very mess and it causes tourists not to come, right? So in Trinidad and Tobago, it's many of our beaches are heavily polluted and it makes it difficult for tourists to want to come to Trinidad for the beaches. They tend to go to the other Caribbean islands for that, right? Um, what have we also seen? Um, the polymer. For example, polyethene is derived from the monomer ethene, right? The polymer polyethene is derived from the monomer ethene. And I'm going to show you a couple more or like that. The polyphenyl ethene is derived from the monomer phenyl ethene, right? Um, the polymethyl 2 propanoate, right, or perspex is derived from methyl 2 propanoate all right so it's derived from it now i'm not expecting you to try to memorize these structures and these names or anything like that but what i want you to see is how the polymer is formed from the monomer again it's just this double bond here that is being broken for it to become a single bond and the rest of the structure remains the same as the unit is being repeated over and over right and again going on we have polymethyl to cyano propanoate cyano is because of the cn group um o8 is because of the c double bond o, o group right here hence it's a ester group with a cyano group but in all of that i want you to see that methyl to cyano propanoate is being repeated all that happens this double bond is being broken and it's now a single bond that's what I want you to see. The double bond has been broken as our single bond. And you would know this as super glue. All right. You use it when you want to stick things together. You know the name as that. So next thing we have um, polychloroethene, right? Polychloroethene, the simple structure. All that has happened is the double bond has been broken. It is now a single bond. You would know, have known this as your PVC. Right, and next one, polytetrafluoroethene. If you look again, the C double bond here is C is broken, and we now have C single bond C. We still have the same number of uh, fluorine atoms present, and that unit is now repeated over and over and over. Right, polypropene. Again. The structure, the double bond is broken, and we only, all we are left with is the single bond, and the structure is repeated over and over and over. So we have the formation of the polymer. From the monomer. Right, the formation of the polymer from the monomer. All right, so we're coming down to the end, guys. All right, the next thing I spoke to you about was the making of um, terrelene and the making of nylon, right? And we talked about the 1,6-diaminohexene, right? Why it was 1,6 is because this is your first carbon, this is your sixth carbon, and we have diamino groups on it, 
This is one amino group, NH2, and this is another amino group, NH2. All right, so hence it's diamino and hexane because we have six carbons and there are no double bonds present. So it's one six diamino hexane. On the, upside, on the next side, we have hexan one six diuyl chloride. Why it's so? Because this is our first carbon and this is our sixth carbon. We have six carbons present, hence it's hexan one six because on the first and the sixth carbon, I have C double bond OCL, hence it's a diuyl chloride. I have two of them, two making it di. So I have diuyl chloride, hexan one six diuyl chloride. Those are the two monomer units that are present. And what's going to happen is that the hydrogen from the first structure and the chlorine from the second structure is removed. And I have the formation of an amide linkage NHC double bond O. I have the formation of an amide linkage from this. I know that no double bonds are breaking, instead a single bond is broken and new single bonds are formed. The monomer units, which are two different monomer units, come together and they're able to form consecutive units. Um, and these consecutive units is what we call the polymer. All right, guys. All right, so this is the linkage that is formed, NHC double bond O, which is your amide linkage. This is something that you, you should now become familiar with, the presence of an amide linkage and what it should look like. All right, and the next thing that I brought to your attention was the benzene 1,4-dicarboxylic acid and the ethene one 2 Diol. Um, this should be hydrogen, as I told you from before. All right, and this here is your benzene ring. They're just using these colors to represent the different ones. Right, and from this structure, the OH group from this is being removed, and the hydrogen from this group is being removed. Water is removed, and then the C double bond O comes and binds with the oxygen here, and we have the formation of a ester linkage. So it results in the formation of a polyester, right? C double bond O, o the formation of a ester. All right, so. All right, so I down to our second to last slide for tonight, right? Natural macromolecules, these are macromolecules that naturally exist. So I'm talking about things like proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, right? Um, they all proteins contain the same linkage, the amide links as a nylon, but with different units. And lipids can see contain the same linkage as terylene, which is the ester linkage, but it happens with different units, right? Um, the C double bond O and H link this year is your amide link or your peptide link, C double bond O, H, uh, NH, that is your amide or your peptide link. And the C double bond O, O is your ester linkage, right? In digestion, proteins are broken down to amino acids, right? Fats are esters, right? Possessing the same linkage as terylene, the ester link but it happens again with different units. Soaps are produced from the hydrolysis of fats. So you split in fat and they would normally use something that is alkalized or so something like sodium hydroxide, right? And that results in glycerol and the salt of the acid, which is the sodium salt um, being produced. The salt is what we use as soaps to, to bathe and keep ourselves nice and clean. Um, the next thing we have complex carbohydrates. Um, these carbohydrates are referred to as polysaccharides and they are derived from monosaccharides, which are glucose units. And they normally join together by a condensation polymerization reaction. Right? 
So all in all, um, this here is just showing you how water is removed from the glucose units and how it results in the formation of the polymer or the polysaccharide. Um, in this case, the example given is starch. Right, so starch is the complex structure and it's derived from glucose. Proteins are the complex structure and they derive from amino acids. Fatty acids, uh, the, the, the fats are the complex structure, the lipids are the complex structure, and they are derived from fatty acids and glycerols. All right, so I want to um, stop there for today, which brings us to the end of this.